you know, in the middle of the first century AD, Caesar Augustus wanted to uh, create favor with the people. So he uh, threw the doors open to the Colosseum so that people could come in without charge and watch the games, even slaves. He gave free bread to the people of Rome, even slaves. He opened up the Hippodrome. Hippodrome was a 250,000 seat oval used for chariot races, kind of a precursor to NASCAR. And they had these races and people could go in, even slaves. Rome had theater after theater where every kind of entertainment, entertainment that would make Vegas blush could be experienced. And if you were a slave of money, they'd let you in too. My guess is that that's why he ventured there. He was on the run. He came to Rome without papers. He would be what we would call an undocumented illegal. He might have been living on the streets and surviving on the free bread and hanging out in the Colosseum or the Hippodrome during the day. There had been a lot of talk in Rome about this man from far away, a man who did miraculous things, a Nazarene named Jesus. Rumor had it that the government had put him to death. In the most cruel way they could imagine, they crucified him. Rumor had it that this young Nazarene in, the, in, the, in this faraway place had done things that no man had ever done. He turned water into wine, which the Romans would have liked to hear about. He uh, healed people of all kinds of illnesses and diseases. Rumor even had it that he was able to raise people from the dead. He did that on several occasions. And the crowning jewel of that was when he walked out of his own grave after being brutally crucified three days earlier. So here's a man who came to Rome on the run, and he runs into another man a man who had been going throughout the entire Roman Empire talking about the Nazarene. Now, he had quite a story himself. Saul used to kill Christians. He was credentialed by his own religion to hunt down the followers of Jesus. It was called the Way, and to kill them. He was on his way to Damascus to do another hit job when Jesus confronted him. Jesus came to him. Saul was on his way to Damascus, and going after these Christians, Jesus appeared, he blinded him on the road, and he said, why are, you, why are you persecuting me? And then he sent him to meet up with some Christians in Damascus, and he had his sight restored, and he was baptized in Damascus, and he was given a new name. Saul became Paul. And he became the primary messenger in the Roman Empire for the next 40 years. And wherever he went, the message was simple. There is one God, I have met him, and he came to save you. And then wherever he went, when he could, he planted a church. But in the Roman Empire, you couldn't teach that there was just one God unless it was the Caesar. There had to be at least two. And so to teach there was one God and it was not Caesar, that gets you put in jail. The idea got you put in, in prison. So Paul was in prison, but he kept touch with churches by writing them letters. And you and I would know these letters as some of the New Testament books. While in prison, he wrote the books of Ephesians and Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, and a little book, a one-page book called Philemon. We're starting a new series that we're calling You've Got Mail, and over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the one-chapter books of the New Testament, Philemon, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. And I think what you're going to find is that there's some great content in these, in these small pieces of mail. Now, I'm going to read you the whole book of Philemon and add some running commentary, pick out some things that I think are important in this, in this letter. So here we go. Philemon chapter, chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, and also to Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, 
a fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in their home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul had planted a church in this community. There were several small groups that were meeting in the city. Philemon and Apphia, they hosted a group in their home. This would be the first century equivalent of an LBS or a rooted or a small group that we have at our church. Archippus was either a son of theirs or a member of their group, or maybe both. And this was a personal letter. Paul saying, Philemon, I have a word for you and your small group. And it involves a cultural issue, the issue of slavery. In the Roman household, the woman of the home would be, in, it'd be the manager over the servants of the home. So this would include her. That's why her name is included in the letter. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, he says. Paul didn't see himself as a prisoner of Rome. He saw himself to be captivated by Jesus. And that's the first takeaway I want to throw at you today. Our position in heaven should always trump our place in life. If you're a Christ follower or you're a son or daughter of Jesus, if you're in good standing with God, no matter what your current situation, your position is in heaven, not in the place that you find yourself. So in this little letter, Paul refers to his situation as being a prisoner. Now think about this. He could have been very bitter about this. He could be sitting there going, God, why do you got me stuck in this prison? Am I planting churches while I'm sitting here? No. Am I sharing the message of hope out there in this world? No. He could have been bitter, but he got better. How did he get better? He got better because he saw it as not a place, but a placement. So think about your circumstance. God, I don't know why I'm stuck in this dead-end job with this boss that's like a slave driver. Can't you get me out of here? What if your attitude went, no, my position is I'm an employee of Jesus Christ in this place. So God, what do you want me to do here while I'm here? Could that change that? I mean, think about this. You say, I'm stuck in this marriage that's so unfulfilling. It's so unloving. But what if your position right now is rather, you know what? I'm under the influence and control of one spouse, and that's Jesus. And so now I'm dedicated to loving this other person just as Christ loves me. Could that change your marriage? Could it? You say, man, this cancer. Why do I have to be stuck in this place? I'm worn out. I have no energy. I go to treatments day after day. I have no value. I can't work. It's costing me a fortune, and I don't know if I'm going to survive. That's not an easy place to be. But what if you leverage that? God, what do you want to do with me in this situation, in this purpose right now? How can you place me differently? How can you leverage your current place from the vantage point of your position in Christ? Here's what Paul did. He wrote letters. He wrote letters to churches. And yeah, had he been out in, the, in, in freedom, had he been roaming around through the empire at that time, he probably would have planted two or three or four more churches in that period of time. But instead, he wrote these letters, which became the New Testament. These letters not only met a few people's needs, but thousands and hundreds, millions of people over the last 2,000 years have come to know Christ through the writings of Paul in the New Testament. Let's read on. He flatters Philemon, verse 4. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us and the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has, uh, this is the last sentence, this last sentence, I want you to focus on this for a minute. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. He thanks him for having an encouraging, refreshing heart toward people. And don't you love refreshing people? Don't you love people who bring encouragement, 
who bring joy into your life. People who find hope and share hope with you. People who encourage and don't discourage. It's really refreshing. It's kind of rare, actually. We've been challenging you over the last couple of weeks to do one act a day. We call it I Raise My Hand to find a person every day who you can just encourage, someone you can refresh. I know some of you say, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm not a preacher. I mean, what am I going to say? What if they ask me about the flood and, and dinosaurs? What am I going to say? Well, that's not your job. Your job is not to answer the question about the flood and dinosaurs. Your job is to encourage. You can encourage. You can bring joy. You know, here's another thing you can do. You can say, well, you know, I don't know if I can answer the question about the dinosaurs, but how about just three words? Come with me. Come with me to the place that I go to find hope. Come with me to my church where we, you know, we, we're encouraged and we find hope in the midst of this life that's challenging to us. Come to the church that's changed how I do my finances. Come to the church that's changed how I see my marriage. Come to the place where people accept me, even though they maybe don't know who I am or what I'm all about, but they understand that I'm like them and I need God. Come with me. You can do that. Who are you supposed to refresh? Now, we're going to read on, and this is one of the best passive-aggressive guiltings in, in the entire history. Okay, so follow this. Verse 8. Remember, he's writing to this man named Philemon. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. That's a really nice way of saying, I'm going to get in your face. All right? It is as... It is, None other than Paul, and then listen to this, like, like, get your fiddle out right now. An old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Who's that? That's that slave we talked about at the beginning of this message. And when he heard the word Onesimus, the name, you know what he thought? Useless. That useless that useless slave who ran away from here, there's a warrant out for his arrest, Paul. Do you know that? He abandoned me. Onesimus, who became my son while I was in change, chains, though he was useless to you, but now he's become useful to me. Very intentional because you know what the name Onesimus means? Useful. Bible names have meanings. This one who you see as useless, he has become useful because of Jesus. And so look at how this plays out. Verse 12, I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. See the guilt rendering here? I would have liked to keep him with me, listen to this, so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. In other words, you know what? He's helping me out. What are you doing for me? <laughs> you know, that's really what he's saying here. He's doing what you should be doing for me. No guilt there. <clears throat> but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and a brother in the Lord. So if you consider to me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Now in the first century, there were roughly 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. About a third to a half of the population of the empire were made up of slaves. When you and I think, about, think of the term slave, our Americanism takes us back to the late 1700s and the early 1800s, and our viewpoint is that a slave is someone who lived in peace in another country far away. Evil people went in and kidnapped them, threw them on these horrible ships, and if they survived the trip to our country, they were bid to the highest bidder, sold to the highest bidder, and then they became a 
you know, uh, in, in horrible circumstances, became a slave of some evil master, which is pretty much how it was. I don't think you can deny that. There's no denying that. But that is not the way Roman slavery worked. In the Roman system, anyone who was not a citizen of the country but lived in the, in the empire was considered a slave. Now, some had more menial, more menial tasks than others, but many slaves were doctors, they were lawyers, they were educators, and they made an income. So what made them different was they were not a citizen of the country. You understand that? And so think about this. Here's a man who'd run away from his master because that was illegal. He fled to Rome. He heard Paul's message. And among other things, Paul was telling people all are one in Christ Jesus. There's neither slave nor free because all of us are one in Christ. So useless became a disciple of Jesus, very useful to Paul. And then he, he tells Onesimus, he says, you got to make it right. You've got to go home. you got to go back to Philemon. you got to do what's right. Little did Onesimus know that he was going to deliver a piece of the Bible to Colossae when he did that. And that's what he did. Verse 18, if he has done anything wrong to you, Philemon, if he owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention what you owe me, which is your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confidence of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to get out of jail. I hope to be restored to you and answer your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He begins the letter with grace, and he concludes the letter with grace. And that's important. The appeal is grace. And there's a message here for both the slave and the slave owner both for Onesimus and for Philemon. The letter for Onesimus is, when you do wrong, you've got to make it right. When you do wrong, you make it right. You go back and you seek forgiveness. For Philemon, it's when you've been wronged, you've got to let it go. You receive him back for what he's become. He's your brother in the Lord. I'm asking both of you to make this right I'm asking you to let it go, and why? Because of the grace of Jesus Christ. What Paul is really telling them to do is to live out what Jesus taught all of us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. And that's where he teaches us, if you're at the altar and you're ready to bring your gift, now we don't have an altar here at this church. We have, the altar is, is Christ and the cross, okay? That's the altar, it's not a church building with a, this is called a platform. This is called a stage, okay? Taylor wanted me to point out it needs carpet. So if any of you are so moved, it does. But anyway, so this is not an altar. But here's, so let me just rephrase this a little bit. If you're at church, or if you're at your small group, and you remember that a Christian brother or sister has something against you, Jesus says, you go find them, you reconcile with them, then come back and present your gift. This is how serious it is to keep score. If you're at church and you know you have a brother or a sister who has something against you, you get up, you go, you make a phone call. You, if you, you go personally, that's even better. You clear the air, you forgive them, and then you come back and give your gift. You clear it up. This is very practical. This works in everyday life. Parents, you'll understand this. You're driving home from church. Kids are in the back seat, and you hear it. You know how it works. He touched me. She hit me with her Sunday school paper. My favorite was always this one. He looked at me. And then you pull into pump and pantry. You say, kids, sit here for a minute. i got to go in and get something. And, and from the back seat, you hear, Dad, can I have some gummy worms? Not on your life. You hit my little girl. 
I'm not giving you gummies. Clear that up. We'll talk about gummies. That's really this message, okay? I'm just telling you right now. That's the way it works. Remember what Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, the next chapter about prayer? And you can finish this verse. Forgive us our debts just as... The other group could, for, could finish it. I didn't hear any of you say that. <laughs> Forgive us our debts just as... That sounds like a clause to me. That sounds like, 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 like a contractual clause. If you do this... I will do that. You say, well, they told me when I said that sinner's prayer that that gave me a continued get-out-of-jail-free card in this church. But when I went to that baptistry, that just meant that, you know what, it's all... Well, there's this. Now that you're a Christian and you understand what God's given you, then forgiveness and grace and mercy are to be continually passed on to others until I come back to get you. Jesus is clear about this. And I wonder how many of us, we pray and we say, God, why don't you hear my prayers? Why aren't you answering my prayers? And all the time, we're holding back forgiveness and we're really doing it to ourselves because how can God answer my prayers if I won't do what he tells me to do when I need to forgive someone? Paul tells the slave, you go make things right, and then he sends a tiny part of the Bible with him, and he tells the man he wronged, that he said, you got to separate culture from Christianity, you got to stop doing this, and you got to forgive him as a man and a brother. So look, if you're sitting there in your small group, and you're all reading from the Bible and getting great messages from it, and then you realize that you need to forgive someone who's hurt you, and and you're just sitting there complaining about how wounded you are, get up, go forgive them, and then come back. That's what he's saying. Because the snacks will still be there when you get back. You know, we have this little phrase that we like to use in American Christianity. I found out it's pretty much just us that uses it. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that sounds great. Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with me. Okay. But when Christ is in relationship with me, it's never just personal. True Christianity will be seen in how we love those who have wronged us. If your personal relationship with Christ just stays private and self-motivated, that means you really don't have a personal relationship with Christ. You have a religion. And religion won't do anything for you. True Christianity shows up with those who have wronged me that I let off the hook. Does that mean I got to let them back in my life? Well, not unless they've earned it. You earn that. Does that mean that I got to forget the wrong? What do you have dementia? Because if you don't, you're not going to forget it. But you need to forgive them. You got to let them off the wrath. You got to let God take the rightful seat as the judge. The Christian receives forgiveness from God, offers forgiveness to others, because that is how God has forgiven me. I will forgive others. True Christianity shows up with those who are different than us. My brother Philemon, accept Onesimus not as a slave, but as a brother. Look, this was revolutionary. You've got to understand this. The Roman Empire was not prepared for this. It's controversial. It's revolutionary. It changed the world. It took thousands of years. It's still happening, but it changed the world. In the church, there is no room for them, there, or they. Truly loving others only happens when we remember that we all deserve death. Well, that's harsh. But we can only true, truly love others who have wronged us when we own the fact that we deserve the wrath right? That I deserve the death penalty for what I've done wrong to God, how I've hurt others. In essence, my sin renders me a runaway slave from God. I'm running from God. I'm looking to this big glorious empire for bread, for distraction, for entertainment, for acceptance. I need a mediator. 
Just like Paul stood in the gap between Onesimus and Philemon, and he said, whatever the debt is that he owes you, I'll pay it. Jesus stands in the gap between God and you and me, and he says, that one, I know the debt is steep, I'll pay it. The rebellion, I'll pay for that. I'll take that one on me. Those sins, too many to count, that guy, I'll wipe the slate clean with my cross, with my blood shed for him. I will cover him. We need our debts paid. I owe a debt. I can't afford it. Someone has to pay it for me. I am a slave to sin. Jesus paid the debt. Philemon, I want to remind you of that. Just like the man you have come to see is useless, so were you, so am I, except that Jesus paid all of our debts. And if that's what he's done for you, that's what you have to do for him. And this supper that we're about to take, that's what it's all about. And if you can't come to it with forgiveness in your heart and understanding that you're forgiven, the supper doesn't mean anything to you. And when you think about this little letter, this little one-page letter that was written, what, 2,000 years ago, some of you might have came here thinking or really not knowing what you were going to think until you heard the message, but you, you found out that letter is written just for me today because I'm like a runaway slave. I'm like that guy on the run. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this empire to fill my needs. I need bread. I need freedom. And you think you're, you're, you're getting freedom in reality. You're a slave. You're a slave to sin and all the things that you've done in your life that's put you in a bad way with God. And so then you hear that there's, there's a Jesus of Nazarene, the Nazarene who can bring you hope, Jesus of Nazareth. And you learn that today. And so I'd invite you to next week, come and be baptized call on his name. For some of you, you're like Philemon. You got kind of a judgmental finger pointed out at somebody else. And you're just waiting to get your hands on them because what they've done to you and how they've hurt you. And what you learn today is that the Christian doesn't hold that sway. We let God be the judge. And in grace, we love others. And so you have some work to do with someone. I hope you'll do it today. Whoever you are today, we're glad you're here and we're glad that you've come to be a part of our day and we want to be a part of your life. So let us know how we can do that. Stop out at the hub and check in with them and let us know that you're here. God bless.